So make sure that all this is on. It's good. Okay. So the good part is you're almost graduated. You have exactly eight more weeks to go to school. I, I'm going to miss you all. All right. All of you. Swear to God. All right, but one of the things that we talk about when we're doing this, and one of the things you guys want to watch out for when you're actually building your systems and you're building your networks, is basically information security kind of relies on the things that we do, and there's a reason why we do all the things we do. <coughs> Believe it or not, there's actually a reason. And it all boils down to CIA, not the classical CIA terror manual, go in, extraordinary rendition, or anything like that. It's called confidentiality, integrity, and availability. When you guys were in 166 and you guys were pounding on those on those victim boxes, you're basically blowing away the integrity of anything that could have been on that box. If you find a box that's been hacked, you don't know if the data's been manipulated or changed. Mm. You don't know if the data's been stolen. So all that integrity just goes flying out the door, right? Confidentiality in that the data is what it is, right? That if it's privacy data, that it's still confidential. So when you find your social security number in Google on a search engine, if you just go and you search for the first six num or five numbers of your social security number, you can pretty much still find out if your social security number has been stolen. It's a pretty easy thing. Don't use your whole social security number because remember, uh, Google keeps track of all your searches. Just use the first five numbers and you can find out if your social security gar card is gone. Same thing with your credit card. It makes for a really interesting day. How many people still Google vanity search your own name to find out what Google knows about you? Good. Do that every time before you fill out a job application because you never know how things are going to change. All right. But the entire industry right now is based on defense. We want to make sure that we defend against the bad guy. And that's where you guys are going to come in because you're that first line of defense. You're the people that are actually going through and making sure the computers are configured correctly and doing other stuff. Offense is a totally different matter. All right, and that's still coming out. There's a 95 point UN United Nations point on cyber warfare on what you can and cannot do. There is a whole slew of recommendations around something called active defense. Um, and if you've never heard of that, it's something that uh, a lot of local governments actually pursue and engage in. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, military, same thing. Right. So there's entire manuals on the on the subject. 833 from NIST is just the start. There's a dozen more. If you really have insomnia bad, start with 833 and work your way on through. You will sleep like a baby for the rest of your life. You'll make it about one paragraph and be. It will be awesome. All right. So confidentiality, right, it refers to preventing disclosure of information, things that you don't want to know about. So people don't really, really, they really don't want to know about a lot of things like what you had for dinner. Although for Instagram, that seems to be the big deal, right? I'm going to take pictures of my food, you know. So confidentiality, I don't really care what you had for dinner. But someone might, a restaurant owner might really care what you had to say about their restaurant while you're in there taking pictures of their food because it looked ugly. If you take a look at the production shot, shots for a McDonald's burger and a commercial versus what you actually get in the box, <laughs> right? Oh, that's my dream, getting that stock commercial yeah. burger. Yeah, so you keep on going back praying to God we get that commercial burger, right? So the system attempts to enforce the confidentiality by encryption, right, or by username, passwords, two-factor authentication. There's all sorts of different ways that we try to make sure that you are actually authorized to do what you are supposed to do. And of course, when you go in on an SMB port because you tap the system, confidentiality is blown out the door because we don't know what you got, right? So confidentiality is necessary but not sufficient for maintaining the privacy of people whose personal information. So why is maintaining privacy not necessarily always contingent upon confidentiality because I can go out and say oh hey here's my social security number five four two seven six blah 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 so so much for that number being private I have to use that social security number on all my taxes um, on all of my school records, on all of my other records. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the likelihood of that number, because it's used so much to identify who I am, being lost through theft, ineptitude, or just interception, really raises. So it's not necessarily a matter of privacy. It's how much that data is used as well and what it's used for, <coughs> right? So when I go and I'm, and I'm getting ready to go to China, I have to give them a picture of myself, which is why I got my hair cut, right? and why I shaved a little bit, right? 
and I have to give them my passport number, <clears throat> I have to give them my driver's license number, and I have to give them my social security number. So all of this now belongs to the Chinese government. They'll have a record in this forever. All right, so this is better than Ancestry.com. If you actually go through Ancestry.com, you can actually search Ancestry.com by social security number. Uh, it's awesome. There's a database in Oregon that records every natural death in Oregon, natural and unnatural death, and they also include the social security number as part of that. <clears throat> integrity. And information security integrity means maintaining and assuring the accuracy and consistency of the data over its life cycle. So if my social security number is 54276 blah 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 and I actually transcribe a number and turn it into 54272, I just took over someone's identity accidentally. Transcription errors happen all the time. If you're going and looking at your credit report, they estimate that the data at best, at best, is 80% accurate. So when I was going and getting my uh, military s security clearance, right, they used my social security number to pull up my credit record. And apparently, I was born in 1964, and apparently I was given a JC Penney card in 1972 with a $10,000 limit. I was eight. They don't normally give eight-year-olds J.C. Penney credit cards with a $10,000 limit because I would have bought every toy at J.C. Penney if I'd known about it. All right. So the other thing too is that my father, who is also Ralph Morrill, had declared bankruptcy in 1984. Well, big surprise because no one knew about it until the Navy is like going. So why did you declare bankruptcy when you were 20? And I'm like, what? <laughs> So these data records are necessarily inaccurate. So the integrity of the data is suspect, right? So if you look at your school records, if you look at your criminal records, if you look at your credit card records or any records that people have on you, the data is necessarily suspect. If you go back through and you pull your Facebook privacy report, it's really interesting what they know about you. But is that data necessarily accurate? Because we don't normally, or we, the, how many people know how Facebook actually works? That there's actually four cookies in Facebook? two that are temporary and two that, that never expire, right? So those two that never expire allows you, if you go out to Gawker or you go out to the New York Times, allows you to like that. So those cookies never expire. But when you log in and you log out, the two temporary ones do. But it allows you to, main, to maintain that persistent connection. So Facebook knows that I really like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and a certain number of porn sites that are also tied into Facebook. But is that necessarily me behind the keyboard or is that someone else like my son's over for a visit? All right. So the integrity of that data over in Facebook is suspect because of multi-user computers. You guys share computers in the other room. What are the other people in the other two classes that are in there doing? All right. So the data is suspect. All right. Availability. Make sure the data is there to serve its purpose. In other words, it's there when needed, as needed. And we've all struggled with that every day, right? So military is bad, credit cards are bad, banking industry is bad, school services are bad. How many times has the school service said, okay, this is all you'll need, just fill out this form. And then you go, you fill out that form, you get it assigned, it takes you a week to get it done, and they say, oh wait, but you need a different form. Right? The military is horrible on this one. So is state, state and federal government. Right? But the availability of that data to serve its purpose may not necessarily be available all the time. Right? Because you are in transition or your forms aren't done right or the data has actually been locked off or the network's down or the database crashed or the backups didn't quite take it over. Right? So that's one of the problems they have at some of the jail systems here is that the databases will crash and they'll lose the last 72 hours of intake. So they'll actually have prisoners sitting in there and they don't know why they're there. Right? And that's a huge, that's one of the things that happens a lot with immigration is they, because you're working with false data in a lot of ways, right? I have an assumed identity. I have a green card that belongs to someone else. I have Dan's social security numbers used about as many times down in San Diego as possible and I don't even live there. Right? But because they don't know who these people are, the availability of the data isn't necessarily there to, to say, okay, you're really a cool Mexican citizen, you're coming over, you're legal, you legally got your green card, you're getting ready to take your oath of allegiance to the United States, awesome. Out you go against the run-of-the-mill drug mule that's coming across through Guatemala and into New Mexico. Right? So we really can't tell who's who. So that availability matters. <coughs> so why is this important? Because if I can go on the internet and I can find out that you're using a router that you've left exposed on the HTML interface for version 12.0, I'm a happy man. I like my life because one of them is in Sunnyvale, California, and one of them is in China. I love this job. 
This is why CIA is important. So how many different ways do you think there are to crack open Cisco IOS 12.0? <coughs> Just a couple, 8,000 different ways. <laughs> so I love this, right? If I own two routers on the internet, what can I do? What does this do for CIA? What does this do for the confidentiality of the data cross in those two routers, one in Sunnyvale, California, and one in China? Confidentiality shot. How about the availability if I get really, really pissed off at you like I did with the PRCCDC team and just decide to zip all your files up and hold them for $3 million worth of ransom? <laughs> Right, your availability is shot. How about the integrity? How do you know I'm not sliding really cool stuff in there like high frequency trading so I can make a couple extra bucks on the market? And it's going to look like it's coming from Sunnyvale, California. So this is why I love my job. But wait, there's more. How do you know who I say I am when I log in? How do you know whose student password really is? All right? If I know your router operating system, I know how to hack it, I can fake the router out, and I can be anybody I want to be. Because remember what happens if you're level four? You can read the configuration file, and what's in the configuration file? The Cisco hash passwords. How long does it take to crack the Cisco hash, hash passwords on 12.0? Simple substitution cipher, about five minutes. I love my job. Authentication, same thing. If I can fake it, I can make it. I do my own thing. Right? Accountability, if I'm logging in as Amelia, my day is happy. Authorization, if I'm root, I can do anything I want to do. So that's why this really matters when you guys are doing all your security, when you guys are actually doing all your patching and your updating and your routers and your switches and all the rest of it, is because there's going to be people like me that are going to be really interested in what you're doing. All right? And when we go through and we do our security <coughs> sweeps, right? when we take this whole room down and we turn it into one great big huge melee of packing tools, I'm going to be right in there with you because I want to own everything that you guys have done because there are no limits when it comes to hacking. Well, outside of getting caught and going to jail. And this is why we have network engineers, and this is why you have specialized in this. And network engineers have a formal development and management process. I bet you didn't know that. So there's a couple of frameworks, right? One that's used a lot is the IATF framework, right? And that involves people, technology, and operations, right? There's got to be a commitment to the process all the way through, from the janitor to the CEO. If any one of these people ain't committed, then they become a danger to themselves and others. Technology. You have the proper technologies in place, and you know how to use them, right? That is one of the big core issues, and that's why you guys have been here and getting hands-on for like two years. It's because we want you to know how to use them. Because if you know how to use them and you know how to configure them correctly, then you're less a danger to the company that you go work for. Because there's a whole lot of people that get their hands on technology and go, yeah, I can run that. And then you see them struggling with simple syntax. Right? They really don't know how to do it. They said something to try to either keep their job, and they're not willing to retrain. All right? So always keep learning. All right? Operations, day-to-day -day activities promote effective security. If you walk in the door and the guard just lets you scoot you on through the barriers for physical security because the physical security is down and they don't even ask you for your badge, then that entry point failed. If I can walk into your building and I can go into a conference room and jack my laptop into the wall or into the wireless and be into your network, then everything you had for physical and electronic security failed because I looked like I belonged, I walked in and no one questioned me. Been done. Right? Enforcement certif cert certification and accreditation, key management, all these things that have to happen for operations. It's a long, long day. So you have the systems development life cycle, which is really kind of interesting. All right? We start off here with initiation. I want to do something really cool. All right? Then we do concept development, and that's where you guys will actually start coming in. You'll actually see systems. I need to do a security enterprise manager software. So what are all the systems that are connected to the network? Every single one. If you're working for Bank of America, that is a nightmare question. <clears throat> if you're working for 7-Eleven, it's really easy. Right? Planning develops project management plans. So this is why your project manager is probably one of the more critical people in the chain because they're going to manage a lot of your political side of it and keeping things on track. Your project manager may not understand the technology like you do, but you have to make sure that you're talking to them. Because if something weird happens on your side that delays the project, your project manager is going to be the one that can politically take care of that delay. All right? Requirements analysis, what do I really need? So I have a mixed environment of Linux, Windows 2008, Windows 2003. I have Cisco router. I have some Belkin switches. I've got some weird gray box. I don't know what quite it does. Right? 
So what are all the requirements that need to make this happen? So when you guys did your RFP and you wrote out what you wanted to build, that was basically your requirements analysis. What do I need to do to get this project off and loaded? Right? You did the design when you did your network design, both physical and logical. Right? Development is what you're doing now. You're building out your operating systems. You're making sure that everything's ready to go. Right? Integration and test, that's what you guys will be doing in <coughs> weeks seven and eight. Right? And nine, because we want to make sure that we tear the thing apart. Then operations and maintenance, week 10 and 11, when I start walking through here to make sure everything's done, that's your day-to-day -day operations and maintenance. That's your help desk people, that's June. Right, that's your network engineers up there in building 30. All of them are in the operations and maintenance, making sure that it stays working the way it needs to be working so people can get their jobs done. And then disposition, we can either go the full office space kind of disposition, taking the printer out into the middle of the field with a couple of baseball bats, but if you're in an environment like a school or a business, did you know that Microsoft donates most of their expired computers? Which is really cool. Microsoft has what's called basically a gummy pile in the back room of every building where all their old computers are stored. When you get a new computer, you just lift your old computer and put it in this room. And then uh, every quarter, one of the big, like, Goodwill or someone comes through and cleans out that room. And then those computers are repurposed to poor schools like in the Rainier Valley or poor people that don't have the resources to buy a new computer. So it's really kind of neat how you dispo stuff. The state has a different dispo. They usually go straight to recycle. Right? So it depends on your company. But wouldn't it be horrible if you, dis if you dispoed the student database computer accidentally and forgot to wipe the hard drive? One of the interesting things you can do, if you go and you buy a used hard drive on, on eBay, and I'll put 50 bucks on this one, odds are highly likely that the, that the used hard drive you buy will have some kind of confidential information on it, whether it's family pictures, whether it's someone's tax returns, whether it's personal correspondence, email, or all the rest of it. Did you guys know, how many people here use Hotmail or Yahoo Mail? Did you, did you realize that it keeps a cache of all your email on your hard drive? So that's really handy. So then I can read all your email. And then if I can crack your, cookie, your cookies, then I have your encryption, encry, encryption strings, because I bet you lay odds that everybody clicks on remember that password on your home computer. <laughs> if you use it right. If you don't use it right, then it's not gonna work. If you don't use it at all. And if you don't use it at all, that's another thing. I mean, usually when I'm dispo on a computer, the first thing I do is just I yank the hard drive. So I've got a, dr a desk drawer full of hard drives, so I have no idea what I'm going to do with. However, you have brought up a really good idea on field testing handy ammunition. So we should probably take the hard drives out to a gun range and use them as targets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So risk assessment. That's one of the things you guys will be doing in week nine. So system characterization, what does it do? How vital is the data on it? Is it a credit card database? Is it a payment processor? Is it a workstation? Makes a difference. Threat identification, what horrible things are gonna happen to this computer? Where is it exposed to? Is it on the internet? Is it in an office behind a firewall, not in front? Vulnerability identification, it's Windows, Linux, Flash, Adobe. Where are all the risks coming from? What are the vulnerabilities, right? Control analysis. How do I make sure that all the computers are the same so I can go through and make sure all the vulnerabilities are taken care of at the same time? Likelihood determination, how likely is it someone's gonna send me an email saying, hey Dan, look at this really cool comic book and I'm gonna open up the PDF and I'm gonna compromise my computer because it's a bad PDF. Uh, that's a pretty darn good likelihood, especially if it's someone's friend's account. I have a friend who lives out in Pennsylvania right now, and about every week she loses control of her email account, and I get a handy email from her saying, hey, look at this cute kitty with a link that's about 40 feet long. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Impact analysis, what happens if that computer gets lost, compromised, or stolen? All right. Risk determination, I take all these, add up the numbers like we did last week and say, okay, this is how critical this system is and this is the resources I need to make sure that it stays up and running. Control determination, how do I make sure all this stuff happens and then results. I always want to document what I did because someone will come along and say, well, you didn't do your job, right? And that will happen anywhere. So I got an email yesterday from somebody way high up in the food chain here at Highline said, well, why don't I have this account? So I sent them the email that I sent them on the 2nd of April saying, here's your account information, your login, your password, and the URL that you go to. And you know, it's funny because I didn't hear from them, but if I hadn't had that original documentation, I would have been available for not doing my job routine. And there's nothing worse than the not doing your job routine. 
risk mitigation options. So when you're doing this, you can either assume the risk and say, okay, these are the things I'm gonna fix it because it's definitely a risk. I can avoid the risk by putting up layers in front of it like firewalls and switched routing and all these other cool things. I can limit the risk by limiting who has access to it and putting all these other things in front of it. I can plan for that risk. If it's a web server on the, on the internet, it's gonna get hacked, I'm gonna plan on here's how I fix it, all right? So if you look at a lot of the government websites, they actually run off CDs. They just boot off the CD and that's your website. So all they've gotta do is if the website gets corrupted, it's a read-only CD, so all they've gotta do is power the computer on and off again. <sighs> and their computer's fixed, but that, doesn't li but that doesn't mean that that hack still isn't valid. So then they've got to go burn another CD that says, here you go, here's how I fix the hack. All right? But it's really easy. Turn it on, turn it off again. And a lot of government sites work that way for the front ends. It just minimizes downtime. It's actually really kind of elegant in a lot of ways. Research and development, a lot of you people will never go there. Right? You're not going to go research new viruses and develop countermeasures to them, which is sad because that's fun. And then risk transference, oh wait, it's not my website, it's actually controlled by GoPro or by GoDaddy's running my e-commerce site for me. So if it gets hacked, it's really GoDaddy's fault and I can sue them later on. Except for that little clause in the GoDaddy contract that says you can't sue me for anything because we're not really responsible. So look at your contracts if you do risk transference and make sure that the other party can actually be really truly liable. Right? And then the stuff you guys are going to do, supporting, preventative, detection, and recovering controls. Right? I'm going to support getting things fixed, maybe do a little bit of preventative application. I'm going to detect stuff as it's happening or after the fact, which is more likely. <coughs> and then I'm going to go ahead and rebuild the computer. And that's probably going to be where you guys are going to end up. So it kind of makes sense on why CIA works and what the systems development life cycle is and why you guys have kind of been learning this and kind of not in that language. Kind of makes sense? Any questions? Okay, you guys are good. Huh? Yeah, I figured you'd like that about the program manager. <laughs>